let's begin with a very quick view on phase diagrams on the decay of the austenitic phase, which produces then martensitic structures. Uh, connected with that is a uh, appropriate heat treatments of this 9% chromium steels, alloying of uh, steels in general. And then I will come to very specific topics which we haven't considered yet for austenitic stainless steels. That's mainly aging in that case and your fair processing in general. I think you all aware <coughs> of phase diagrams because this is um, a topic of the basic courses, but just as a reminder or review of the things, phase diagrams show you how the mix of at least two different elements behave in terms of thermodynamics. Here in the diagrams is the concentration. It starts in this example with 100% nickel on the one hand and 100% copper on the other hand and there is a mix in between. Temperature is on this axis and you have to read this phase diagram starting from the liquid phase as it's cooling down and producing several phases during this cooling down. Of course, these diagrams show you only the thermodynamical equilibrium, which is usually reached after several million years or so. Well, in some, some cases it's, it's reached after some days, but in principle you have to wait for a very, very long time until these phases have fully developed. So this is a, uh, the case if two elements are completely soluble in the liquid as well as in the solid state. This means we start here from the liquid phase, cool down, then you see here a second phase, depending on temperature and concentration, where both um, elements mix. In this phase they produce a solid state, that's the mixture of A and B component. They form a solid solute, that's a, a crystal lattice, a solid lattice with a mixture of both uh, types of species, of atoms and the rest is still in liquid phase. If you cool further down, what you end with is so-called alpha phase. That's the mixture of both in solid state. That's quite simple. There are a lot of examples. Tungsten tantalum, copper nickel, iron nickel, and uh, silver gold. That's uh, one of the several uh, possibilities we face. Another one is if you to mix uh, two different kinds of elements, they can show you a complete solubility only in the liquid phase, but in the solid phase, in the solid state, they are completely insoluble. This means they don't mix in the, in the solid state. In this case, the phase diagram looks like that. The line where we have transformation or a transition <coughs> from liquid to solid, the liquidus line, shows a minimum at some point of concentration. And um, well, otherwise, here we are liquid. <coughs> here again, we have solid and liquid phase. And only here, we have completely solid phases, a completely solid phase. The point here where we have a minimum of the melting temperature, this is called the eutectic, the eutectic composition. So this is the eutectic line here and as, as soon as you come down temperature below this line, uh, the material form this eutectic composition, that's something very specific and the rest uh, which is not needed to form this phase is either component A or B. Um, well, 
For such specific phase diagrams, there are only a few examples. Bismuth cadmium is one, or lead tin, or lead antimony. That's uh, a few of that. The microstructure looks very specific for this eutectic. Eutectic uh, in English means beautifully shaped. I'm not so sure whether I consider this as a beautifully shaped, but at least it's interesting shaped, interestingly shaped. That's, um, well, we come back to that later. There is also in, in steels, we know this from the Lady Burit phase, uh, phase that's cast iron looks similar to that. This is an example also for an eutectic mixture. Much more frequently, we have a mix of both fundamental phase diagrams. And this means we have complete solubility in the liquid phase only. And we have not complete insolubility, but a limited solubility in the, sol in the solid state. And there are much more examples here, even if I have given uh, only two. That's uh, silver copper or copper aluminum. So there are mirror image on the left and the right hand side. Let's have a look here. What happens if we cool down with a composition along this line? First, again, the transition into solid and liquid state. Here, the solid state is a solid solute. That's a specific mix of pure A and pure B component. So that's again a, a crystal lattice. And then we reach a smaller area here in this case where the whole thing is solid, an alpha crystal, solid solute crystal. And if we again transit over this line here, then this alpha solid crystal decomposes because uh, both components are not soluble anymore. So in that case, a second phase precipitates inside the crystal. That's the beta phase. And uh, since it's a segregation, it's uh, indexed with this name. And so if we have such a composition, <coughs> this is the typical case for metals or for alloys that can be precipitation hardened. You bring the whole system into solid solution here in alpha phase. Then you quench them down or cool them down rapidly. And by a additional thermal treatment, or if you have uh, time to wait, then you wait until the segregation takes place. And this produces you uh, precipitates in the material, which <coughs> brings the hardening. In between, it behaves like any other eutectic system, like we have seen before. And uh, well, outside this line, if the concentration is in between, it's just like the first fa phase diagram I have shown you. So that's very basic. The influence on the microstructure is maybe the most important thing here. If you have such a composition as that, which could be used as precipitation hardened alloy, then you have the grains, which consist of this alpha solid solute, that's the, the, the crystal. And inside the grains, but preferably along uh, grain boundaries or also again along um, dislocations, these precipitates of the second phase form. In between, where uh, we have eutectic or near eutectic compositions, first the grain forms during um, cooling down, and then inside the grains, the eutectic structure forms. That's uh, for the exact eutectic composition. If we have a deviation from the eutectic composition, then beside the eutectic structured grains, we also have uh, either beta or alpha solid solutes. So it's a typical two-phase material here. And well, if the concentration is high or low enough for the one or other component, what you end up with is uh, the usual solid solute. 
There are also solid state phase transitions. You don't in each case have to start from the liquid. Sometimes, for example, if you have uh, reached a solid uh, crystal of uh, alpha composition and you cool it further down, then um, further decomposition or formation of a second or a third phase appears. There are several cases. This one here is uh, very prominent in chromium steel, where uh, chromium iron mixed crystal decomposes into yeah, alpha prime and sigma phases. That's uh, several <laughs> other possible phases which could uh, form here, depending on the chromium uh, concentration. This one here is a mix of the two fundamental phase diagrams. First we have again transformation in the solid solute and then the solid solute depending on the concentration can show further segregation as we had before. But in this case the, the decay or decomposition starts in the uh, solid phase, not in the liquid. And here a very important example for this type of phase diagrams, at least the lower part, is uh, related to steel, to the iron carbon system. You all know for iron that we have uh, phase transitions due to the lattice structure depending on temperature. At the lower temperature range it's a BCC structured iron. Um, then with higher temperature, the lattice changes its, in its configuration into FCC structure and only at very <coughs> high temperature again back to BCC structure. The lower temperature BCC structure is called alpha iron, gamma iron, that's the part where we have FCC structure, delta iron, that's again where we have BCC structure but on the higher temperatures. Depending on the cooling rate if you cool it down or depending on the cooling rate if you uh, heat it, uh, heating rate if you heat it up. We have uh, several specific transition lines, that's the transition temperatures and that's the case for pure iron. Now, and well, I have to apologize, most of the steel uh, diagrams I have are in, in, in German language because, yeah, well, steel is a very specific topic and I didn't have the time to tr translate each and everything, but I still, uh, I think you still can translate it very easily. Basic German lesson, Kohlenstoff means carbon and Temperatur means temperature. I think that's uh, already enough. So here we have the Kohlenstoffgehalt, that's the carbon content, and of course, in iron you can only solve 6.67% uh, carbon because then you end up already in a iron carbide, which uh, is completely useless. That's a, a, well, a carbide material. So the phase diagram ends here. You can also consider it as a mixture of iron and iron carbide. Then you start here with complete with 100% iron, but still end here with 100% iron carbide. Here you see a lot of phases, and uh, let's say most of the right parts are completely uninteresting uh, when it comes to fusion. We can maybe completely skip that. The more important part is here where we have uh, the gamma phase, the FCC structured ion carbide system or ion carbon system. But anyway, this is what I was referring to the eutectic point and that's um, maybe the first deal uh, ever produced on earth because the old uh, Neanderthals or however the guys are, have been called, when, when they mixed iron or ore or whatever heated it up, they simply end up here due to the fact that 
this combination, the mix of iron with 4.3% carbon produces the lowest melting temperature. This is what we call cast iron, that's a very brittle material and yeah, not, not very useful <coughs> on that point. That's why we skip from here, from carbon, carbon contents more than 2%, skip this completely. The interesting point where we later will focus on austenitic steels, they have almost no carbon inside and also the 9% chromium steels like Eurofer in, in the fusion for fusion application has a carbon content of 0.02%. So we are really here on the very left hand side. Uh, the phases as said are called austenite when it is FCC structured. It is ferrite, that's this tiny small area uh, when we have BCC structure and the uh, well more complicated phase system I will also uh, uh, leave this over. This is again where we have uh, at a very high temperature again BCC structured. Perlite is a mixture of this uh, eutectoid system. It's comparable to eutectic system, but it's a solid-solid transformation, so in principle it's the same. This is uh, forming also within this system. What you can very easily deduce from uh, such diagrams is the solubility. For example, in this case for carbon in iron. You see here, this is the maximum content of carbon which can be solved in iron, that's about 2%, 2 percent, 2 weight percent carbon, which can only be completely solved at uh, this temperature around 1, uh, 1150 C in the austenitic phase. If you cool it down, you have immediately decomposition, perlite formation, and uh, compare it with BCC structured iron. Here we have a point with 0.02 percent carbon, that's the maximum content of carbon you can solve in the BCC structured lattice. This is important for the further consideration. This is a magnification of exactly this edge in the iron carbon system. Again, 0.02 percent is the solubility limit in uh, the alpha iron and 2 percent, that's the solubility limit in gamma iron. This is how the steel looks like. <coughs> Ferrite has this, let's say, more round shaped grains. That's typical for the ferrite uh, iron. If the carbon content is increased, then we have a mix of ferrite <coughs> and perlite. That's an example of 0.3% carbon. The white ones, this is ferrite. The dark ones, this is the perlite, the uh, you take to eat phase. 100% perlite is here with 0.8 carbon. Again, I don't think it's beautifully shaped. It's strange shaped, but nevertheless, that's perlite. And again, if you increase the carbide content uh, to higher values, then uh, it's a mix of perlite and cementite. Cementite is Fe3C, that's the iron carbide. Now the most interesting part in steels doesn't end here. It is um, very tricky or beautifully and unique to, or, yeah, I, I think unique to iron. If you heat it up in the austenitic phase and then you cool it down with varying speed or varying, uh, varying quenching rate. Then something strange happens because then you leave the phase of so a thermodynamic equilibrium. Time scales are much faster and as a consequence the phase diagrams are not valid anymore. They have to be modified. <coughs> 
This again is the phase diagram of the low carbon content in iron. Austenite, if you cool down, you finally end in a mixture of ferrite and perlite. This is the situation. Now here is a diagram where you are continuously heating up. Well, I forgot to say, the first step is we want to bring the steel into the austenite phase. So we have to heat it up. If you do this very slowly, then uh, everything goes according to the phase diagram. At some temperature, um, the ferrite and carbide uh, solve, they dissolve. Then uh, at higher temperature, you reach a phase where we have austenite, but still some carbides, which are left over. And only if you go to even higher temperature, when you are here in the middle of this phase, more or less, and wait some time, then we have 100% austenite. If you do it too quickly, or rather fast, then uh, all this dissolution cannot take place and what you end up is not with a complete austenite, but there are still perlite phases or carbide phases inside. So, <coughs> usually you do this not by heating up. Normally you take a piece of steel, put it in a furnace at one and the same temperature. That's a isothermal heating. So, in an isothermal diagram, you see how long it takes until your material, when you start from ferrite and, ferrite and perlite phase, until a complete dissolution or solution into austenitic phase uh, has happened. Depending on time, here in second, uh, it needs 10,000 seconds at that temperature to reach this austenitic phase. From now on, we consider that we have, as a starting point here, fully austenitic phase. Everything else has uh, dissolved, has been dissolved. Then the microstructure should look like that. That's a typical microstructure of a, in that case, it's an austenitic steel, but in an iron carbide austenite phase, it will probably, or it, I will show you later, it looks uh, the same. This is our starting point, 100% austenite, and now we cool down. Then, again, phase transition happens, different thing happens, and the question is, where can we end up? There are several possibilities. We can end up in 100% ferrite. We can up end up also in a carbide phase. There can also be uh, different, more or less fine structured perlite phases, then, uh, well, let's keep this one. And if you do it very quickly, we can end up in a so-called martensitic phase, martensite formation. Um, there is something in between. This is referred to as finite. But as I said, this is not so important. Also, if you do it too quick, uh, some fraction of austenite may still survive the quenching. And, well, you see, steel provides a variety of probabilities, of, of uh, um, possibilities, how it can end up if you cool down from the austenitic phase. If you do it rather slowly, then if you do it very slowly, then you can rely on the phase diagram. If you do the quenching with a higher speed, then the transformation shifts with increasing speed to deeper and deeper temperatures because you are, well, hurrying. You, you are too fast to have time for all the transformation. So, the, uh, the original equilibrium phase diagram has to be modified. All this phase lines are shifted downward towards lower temperatures. Now let's do it rather slowly. What happens? We have the gamma, the austenitic phase, and if you cool it down, then you have seen the solubility for carbon goes also down. So the carbon wants to go or has to go out of the crystal lattice. And um, 
that's quite easy for carbon because it forms the ion carbide. Then at some point it forms such an ion carbide phase. It looks like that schematically. And uh, this happens until the carbon content is uh, low enough in order to avoid further decomposing. Then the temperatures are low enough, carbon content is low enough to form the alpha phase. If this has happened, it's happening in, in, in the vicinity of this uh, carbide, then we have the alpha phase. Then again, the temperatures are too low to keep all the carbon in, in solid solution. Then carbon precipitates again in form of Fe3C and so on and so on. And in the end, we have very fine shaped structures and you have seen this so-called beautifully shaped. That's the perlite. That's what happens in slow motion cooling down. Now let's see what happens if you do this more quickly. Here, ah, again I forget to translate, Abkühlungsgeschwindigkeit, that's the third word. That's simply cooling, cooling rate. Here we have the cooling rate in Kelvin per second. If you do it very slowly, everything happens as I have shown before, perlite formation. This is the important transition line here. If you speed it up, then as I said, this line is shifted toward lower temperatures. And you can see it here in this diagram. This transformation line from austenite to ferrite and perlite, or from FCC to BCC lattice structure, goes down with increasing cooling rate. Goes down, goes down, goes down. And at that point, if we have cooling rates up to about 250 Kelvin per second, we still produce perlite in the one or other way. But then, if we um, go even to higher cooling rates, more than 250 Kelvin per second, uh, this transition line goes even further down, but then you see there is uh, the appearance of another transformation line. And this is the critical cooling rate to produce the martensitic structure. We will go much more into detail later on. As for now, it's uh, enough to say there is a still another phase called martensite or martensitic phase, which appears only if you cool down fast enough. So we have produced here perlite, a very fine perlite structure, but still with further cooling down we produce a martens martensite phase. Then if you increase the cooling rate further and further, then there is another <coughs> limit, 600 Kelvin per second. If we go above this level, then there is no formation of perlite anymore. There is only martensite formation. And uh, this phenomena is used in a, well, very specific way for a, a broad variety. For example, this 9% chromium steel as we see later. But it also works for a simple iron carbon steel. That's a, a mild steel. If the carbon content is high enough, you quench it with a critical temperature, you will end up in a phase which does not appear in the thermal equilibrium phase diagram, and that's martensite. What is martensite? There is a, well, very simple model to show this, but then again it's not so simple. Maybe if you can imagine in three dimension uh, lattices, it's, I, I tried or somebody tried to show it here. The white dots, these are iron atoms. Here in the FCC lattice, that's a phase centered lattice, you see it here, four on the corners, one in the middle of the phase. But we have a mix of iron and carbon atoms. So the black ones, that's the carbon atoms, they are located 
on uh, interstitial sites. And the preferred sites for carbon are well indicated here. And uh, as a mix of both, you see here the black outlined structure within the FCC structure. And this can be already considered as sort of a banded uh, BCC structure. And if you cool down with a high enough speed, as we have seen, then the, well, an easy explanation is the quenching is so fast that the carbon atoms have no time to diffuse at some other place. They are captured within the iron lattice. And, well, as a result, we end up not in a BCC, not in a FCC structured we, uh, <coughs> lattice, we end up in a tetragonally <coughs> banded BCC structure. In principle, it's a BCC structure. On each corner, we have an iron atom in the middle of this uh, structure, we also have an iron, iron atom that's a body-centered structure. But the structure is not equally on, on all sides. It's a bit banded along one axis. So that's what we call a tetragonally banded BCC elementary cell. And that's the Martin side lattice structure. Depending on the carbon content, it needs more or less quenching rates. I have already told you, uh, around 1% carbon content, uh, it's rather easy to produce such martensite or martensite structured lattices. Well, you need rough, a, a bit more than 200 Kelvin per second. That's quite easy to handle. So far, that's all basic and theories, but I have seen a very beautiful video where you can see in situ how this martensite forms starting from an austenitic structured uh, steel. And you see, formerly we had the austenite grains and then very quickly we get some features inside this grain and, uh, well, temperature comes down here to 300 C, and this is where we end up during the transformation. Let's start again. Here you see the grain boundary of a typical austenitic steel grain. That's a typical uh, hexagonally or nearly hexagonally shaped. Then uh, at that point we are at 460 C, then we cool down, and at some point during this cooling down, very quickly, with a, within a blink of an eye, or probably with speed of uh, sound waves, very quickly there are quite different shaped structures appearing, and this is what it's called Martin City formation and how it looks in C2 <laughs> under a uh, transmission electron microscope. Depending on the carbon content, whether you have a higher content or a lower content, in the microstructure and optical view, optical microscope pictures, it looks like that. Very, very fine structured. Uh, subgrains or whatever you want to call it appear and it, you, you cannot easily recognize these former austenite grains. If the carbon content is much lower, here is an example for 0.03% carbon, that's about the carbon range for uh, uh, Eurofair steel, you still can see where the former austenite, austenitic grains were been, uh, have been, but inside these grains we have this severe change in microstructure. And <coughs> this is, again, martensite. If we have low carbon, then it's called plate martensite or massive martensite. If there is a higher carbon content, much higher carbon content, then it's needle, called needle martensite or sometimes also last martensite. That's the effect of quenching from the austenitic phase. If you buy a steel 
from a manufacturer, he provides this uh, steel with a diagram, a continuous TTT. This means uh, temperature time transition. Here we have the time axis, logarithmic, the temperature. And this shows you, if you follow a specific line here, the quenching effect depending on the quenching rate. This one, this line is continuous cooling down very slowly and you see you enter here a phase. The phases are um, drawn inside the diagram. The phase shows here F. This means ferrite or P perlite. So if you do it slow enough, you can produce perlite from the one and the same steel. If you do it very quickly, then for example you follow this line, then you have a complete transformation from A, that's austenite, down to martensite. So if you do it fast enough, you will end up in 100% martensite. There is something in between, which I have called binite, which we don't <coughs> go further into detail here. And uh, interesting is a further technical information, all this line end with a number. And this number gives you the hardness where you end up. Low numbers are soft, hard numbers are hard, strong materials. You see, perlite, ferrite, that's very soft, <coughs> a very soft material. And here, um, 57, that's a hard material. So, already here you see, martensite is a very hard phase, whereas perlite or ferrite is a soft phase. But still, it's one and the same steel. We, we, doesn't, uh, we haven't changed anything in the chemical composition, just by different <coughs> cooling rates starting from the austenitic phase. Well, if you have done this and you have ended up with martensite, which is due to the bended lattice, very brittle and very hard, um, in that case, Steels are not very useful, except very few, oh, well, maybe it's not so few, but very specific applications where you need a hard steel. That's maybe the edge of a, of a knife. This has been hard and sharp, and well, if it is hard, the wear is low, so you have a long-living good knife in principle. And well, in human history, such things are most often used for military purposes and all of this bullshit started with pro the production of knives and swords and things like that. So these are the typical applications. But you can change them again by heat treatments. Here is a very quick or brief overview on several heat treatments depending on the phases where you start and uh, use this in the iron carbon diagram. Also for me, it is uh, probably uh, for, for you too, it's not uh, easy to distinguish between different um, names in different languages. In, in, German, in the German language, we have very precise and, and different names for each kind of tempering and annealing and so on. English language, even for me, it's complicated enough, but it's uh, in, in general more easy. And they have only two or three of these words. So uh, let's keep, uh, or well, it, it's my terminology, solution annealing or austenitization. This is all the heat treatment which brings you in the austenitic phase and which dissolves all of the carbides and whatever you have in your steel. And uh, well, so this often is called diffusion annealing or high temperature annealing, or it's also called hardening, even due to the fact that nothing is hardened, but it's the first step to produce a hardened steel because you produce this austenitic phase, but you have to quench it down rapidly enough to produce this hard martensitic phase. And also frequently it's called normalizing whatever. So this is the first part of the heat treatment to produce the austenitic phase. Then you quench down. If you have quenched down, there are other 
heat treatments, I call them or name them tempering to distinguish between annealing, which means solution or whatever, tempering. Tempering in a certain temperature range relieves the stress in the steel. There are, due to fabrication routes, could be many internal states of stresses. If you temper them uh, in a, well, let's say in that temperature range, five to 600 C or so, you relieve this internal stresses, but without changing anything else. Then the Martin site can also be changed by tempering. Of course, you have to do the tempering below the transition line from alpha to gamma, but if you do it in this temperature range, then, and do it for a long enough time, then remember the carbon is captured in this tetragonally bended BCC lattice. If you give time or have time enough to wait, do tempering, let's say it 400 C or so in this uh, iron carbon steels, then the carbon goes out of this lattice. It, well, diffuses somewhere, we will see later where it goes, but it goes out of the lattice and what <coughs> is left over is a more or less carbon-free lattice again. So there is no reason for the lattice to be bended, so it is relaxed, it goes nearer or almost into a original BCC structured lattice, and then the reason for this very hard and brittle martensite phase has gone. And what you have, what you have left over, is still the martensitic microstructure with all these lars or lancets or whatever you call these fine uh, structured things you have in the mar uh, martensitic microstructure. But since the carbon has gone out, it's softer than it was. It's not as hard anymore, it's softer and more ductile. And then this is a real good material because in principle you have done nothing else as produced uh, one of our basic hardening methods, namely produced a very fine structured material. And this is the primary use of austenitic steel for structural application. You produce them, you temper them, then they are not so brittle anymore, but they are still uh, strengthened, which means they have an enormous uh, yield strength, uh, tensile strength whatsoever, but they are also uh, ductile. They can be bended, formed, whatever. They don't break as easily. Of course, in this form, they are not so useful for knives at the edges, but they are useful for pipes and other structural application. And this is the basic mechanism, which is shown here again. First step is producing austenite with a high enough temperature. Then you quench down fast enough to produce this martensitic structure and followed on by a tempering period. It's a bit softened, but you see, this is perlite, which we started from. Then this is heated up to austenite and quenched down. You end up in a martensitic structure. And if you temper it, the carbon diffuses out of the <coughs> lattice. It ends on the grain boundaries, where else? And then it looks like that. So it still has a very fine microstructure. And this brings the good effect in this martensitic steels. What happens with austenitic steels or ferritic steels? That steels which don't show this transformation from FCC to BCC and vice versa. If you want to change their microstructure, then you can do only one thing. You can heat them up. What happens? The grains grow for a certain amount and that's it. But we are most often not interested in coarse grained. We are most often interested in fine grains due to the hardening effect. And the only thing you can do with such materials is you have to cold form them. You, you really have to hammer them or roll them, forge them, whatever. And then if you heat them up, they start to recrystallize. This is shown here in a cold worked tensile specimen. And after some time, new fine grains nucleate and with time they grow and grow and grow and grow ever larger. 
And this is the only way how you can change the microstructure in austenitic steels or in ferritic steels. With ferritic steels, I mean, I will also come to back later, steels which don't show this phase transformation. That's the basic of steels with respect to the microstructure and transformation. Now, um, the simple iron carbon steels are, uh, well, the most prominent steels, but for fusion applications and energy uh, applications in general, they are not so interesting. Here we need very specific um, behavior of the steels, and this can be very precisely changed by additional alloying elements into the steel beside carbon. And this we will see here. Again, this is the iron carbon phase diagram, the, the relevant part of it. And if you add to such an alloy molybdenum, tungsten or chromium, this point, the uh, one end of the austenitic phase is shifted in that way. Uh, elements like chromium, tungsten, silicon or uh, manganese shift this point in that direction. So the effect of alloying different elements into a steel is you in general um, modify the shape of the phase diagram of the ion carbon phase diagram. We also have to keep always in mind that uh, steels, or at least the mild steels, um, are not very pure. They always have a certain amount of carbon, silicon, manganese, phosphorus, sulfur, etc. inside. That's the so-called accompanying elements. To get rid of them needs a special treatment during production. In general, the effect of different types of elements as alloying elements in steel are subdivided into two categories. One are ferrite formers, the other ones are austenite formers. Ferrite formers, they reduce the austenitic field, the gamma field. If you add elements of this kind into the steel, then the gamma phase field is reduced significantly. Um, austenite former, are, they enlarge the austenite phase or the gamma field. Um, you see carbon and nitrogen uh, along with manganese and nickel are the most effective austenite formers. So if you want to end up in a steel which has more of the austenite phase, you have to add most of these elements. If you want to reduce the austenitic field, so, and well, this means effectively to increase the ferritic field, then you have to add up these elements. <coughs> Again, this is the effect of ferrite formers. Instead of the former iron carbon diagram, we have now a iron and ferrite former diagram. If you add enough, of one or several of these elements, the gamma phase is restricted to a very small uh, border here. And uh, you see, if you have enough of uh, these elements in, then you end up here in only one phase, that's the ferrite phase. For example, if you use uh, steel with 16% chromium, you would be along this line here, and what you have is a steel without phase transition. It always has a ferrite phase, nothing else. If you reduce the amount of, in this case, chromium, the border here is at 12%, which is an important one. If you have a steel with less than 12% chromium, then you end up here in this phase field and then you still have phase transformation. This was, would result with 9% chromium in a Eurofer type steel. Then uh, the other example, 
austenitic steel. You have to add, let's say, a lot of manganese, also some nitrogen and nickel, for example. This enlarges very broadly the gamma field, the austenite phase. And uh, in the end, you can, if you have enough of this material inside, of this element inside, you have only one phase field, that's gamma. Uh, you can heat up or cool down. The steel doesn't matter. You always end up in an austenitic phase, in an austenitic steel. So this would be the case for uh, um, the 316 stainless steel. I think we can skip that. There is another diagram <coughs> which shows you approximately or gives you approximately uh, a, a, a recipe, recipe of how to produce steels of different kinds. You have here the amount of uh, ferrite formats that's called chromium equivalent or the amount of austenite formats that's the nickel equivalent. You calculate it with this formula and up in a point and this point gives you the structure of your steel. It could be either martensitic, austenitic, ferritic or some mixture of both phases. Here is where we end up with 316 steel. 316 steel come with a variety of different composition ranges so this field here uh, produces 316 austenitic steels and you see that's exactly or depending on the specific mixture more or less on the border between austenite and ferrite and this has a reason but again these are uh, uh, very specific topics for example a glatting material for fission reactors also austenitic steels you end up here fully in the middle of the austenitic phase Eurofair and its composition, you end up here in the diagram. It shows you that's uh, martensite, martensitic steel. And uh, these ODS steels, these ferritic ODS steels with 13 and more chromium, you would end up here along that line in the ferritic phase. This is how you can produce different type of steels depending on the alloying. Now, you know how to produce different type of steels. <coughs> Let's see what is specific to the 316 austenitic stainless steel. This is, uh, comes into various brand names. In, in, in Germany, it, uh, there is um, one called Nie Rosta, which means it never rusts or something like that. So uh, it's clear with such a high amount of chromium, 17%, this type of steel is really uh, corrosion resistant, so it really never rusts or almost never. That's a, <coughs> a very broad application for these steels. The usual 316 without <coughs> any addition um, has this composition. Then there are some uh, sub-versions of these steels with a lower carbon content it's called 316L and again with a higher nickel, molybdenum and nitrogen content it's called 316LN and with an even more precise specification it's called uh, 316LN ether grade. This is a summary of the behavior of the 316 steel <coughs> and how it looks like. Most often you see the remainder of the rolling or forging direction. If, if it has been produced in huge quantities, you always have to consider this or take it into account that you will never get a, a perfectly shaped and perfectly structured, structured steel. But anyway, it's an austenitic steel, has an FCC lattice, is corrosion resistant and one very beneficial property for fusion application, it's non-magnetic. You know, in fusion application for the confinement, we have to deal with very strong magnetic fields and so it helps if your structural material is non-magnetic. Drawback <coughs> is more or less, it can be strengthened only by cold working 
And uh, well, cold working doesn't work at higher temperatures. That's obvious. So the only strengthening effect here is not true for high temperature applications. So in fact, you cannot strengthen it further. Uh, it can only be um, recrystallized after cold work. This means if you have a component and by an accident or whatever the grain grows happened and, and, and the grains are too coarse for the first application uh, specification for this component, well, you can throw it away because cold working a component means destroying it. So you have no measure to restore or restructure <coughs> microstructure in a real component. That's the main drawback here. The operation temperature nevertheless is up to about 600 C. Definition of operating temperature in energy application corresponds to uh, creep strength for 100 MPA and a lifetime of 100,000 hours. This is uh, more or less the definition of operation temperature. Since it is FCC structured, you know it by now, it shows no DPDT. So it is perfectly well suited for low temperature applications. But again, in fusion reactors, the low temperature applications are mainly due to magnets and uh, cryostats. So here it fits, fits quite well. Drawbacks are the high thermal expansion and the low thermal conductivity. There is one other drawback which you should keep in mind if you ever want to use 316 steels at higher temperatures or for high temperature application. They are very prone to what we call thermal aging. And this is the effect on the microstructure, for example, after 85,000 hours at 600 C. And what you see here in between the former grain boundaries is again a structure which doesn't, at least to me, not look beautiful, but for some microscopist it's, uh, well, looking quite beautiful. What it is in reality is an intermetallic phase, a mixture of iron nickel and a mixture of chromium molybdenum. And um, it takes quite a big area within the grains. And uh, well, this is called sigma phase and it is a very brittle phase. So you can imagine if you have grains separated by something very brittle, then this is the place where it wants or where it uh, preferably breaks. So this aging has a very negative effect on the material properties of steels. Also, you see here an example where a carbon rich um, compounds, that's M stands for metal, metallic, metal carbides, where they go, uh, if they can diffuse, they end up at the grain boundaries. We have in this image here um, dissolved the metal matrix with acid and what remains is corrosion resistant carbides here at the former grain or at the grain boundaries and this is also an aging effect. With the TEM you can make a very good comparison. This is the 316 steel <coughs> as delivered with a very thin grain boundary and the change of the chemical um, composition over, the, over this grain boundary is almost not recognizable, it's almost constant. So a grain boundary is, ha, has no negative effect on the 316 steel in the state as delivered. But after 85,000 hours, you see the grain boundary is broader now. And if you again make a chemical analysis along this line, you see uh, iron is lost in this grain boundary and uh, we have a high amount of molybdenum, at the edges some chromium. So what we have here is what is called Lavis phase. That's also an intermetallic phase here, which embrittles the material. Carbon precipitates can also appear within the grains. They are, uh, well, very many here. After only 
a few thousand hours, but at 750 C, this is all contributing to the thermal aging. And in the end, what is, has been provided or is delivered along with this austenitic steel is an aging map. This is a map over the time which shows you the areas uh, in terms of temperatures and time where all these second and other phases appear. To operate this material, you should avoid all these phases completely, which means um, up to, let's say, 10,000 hours, you should reduce the temperatures down to 520 centigrades in this case. If you want to have it for longer times, 100,000 hours, and you want to avoid most of these dangerous phases, you have to restrict your uh, application temperatures further. And so, in <coughs> the end, the um, positive effect of using austenitic steels, namely the higher application temperature, is again significantly reduced if you have to use them for longer times. And this is the main drawback beside all the irradiation issues we have already treated for 316 steels. Now let's come finally to the Eurofair steel. As you have already seen, it is a very uh, easy mixture of a steel. There are only a few elements, that's chromium in the range of 9%. Uh, very low uh, carbon content, 0.1% uh, around. Manganese, some addition of vanadium, 1% tungsten, uh, tungsten, some tantalum, some nitrogen, and that's it. <coughs> Everything else is not wanted in the steel. So we want to, or you have to produce it very purely to get rid of all these other elements, and this makes this material more expensive. Where uh, we have especially careful to avoid elements, this is for niobium, molybdenum, and aluminum. These produce these very long living isotopes, even in, in the PPM range, which, which means parts per million range of these elements, it would destroy the low activation capability of Eurofair. Then there is nickel, which we also want to avoid due to helium formation, and copper as well. Cobalt, and to a certain degree also tantalum, contributes to short-term activation. That's another issue when it comes to radioactivity. Uh, For example, if you shut down the reactor and you want to exchange a breeding blanket or a diverter cassette, then especially elements like cobalt and um, yeah, to some amount tantalum keep the activity rather high, but only for a few weeks. So in the long term, when it comes to waste, that's not a problem, but you want to exchange your components rather quickly. Two weeks shut down for a reactor is already a, a significant long time. So uh, if you have these elements inside, this have an effect on the interchange of um, elements, breeding elements or things like that. Now, uh, let's come to Eurofair. As said, this is a Martin Citic steel. You see it here in this uh, typical Martin Citic structure. You can easily see the former austenite grains. It's PCC lattice. Unfortunately, it's also magnetic, which has an effect on the whole uh, plasma physics inside the reactor if you use it. But it's low activation and it is aging resistant. You can. Uh, keep it at temperatures for years and it doesn't change the chemical composition. There are no formation of uh, second phases. The microstructure here can be easily controlled by heat treatment. That's uh, the big difference to the austenitic steels. Let's assume you have a component, for example, such a, let's say, breeding box. And, um, well, after some time, <coughs> 
somebody gets the idea the microstructure is not good enough, you want to have it more fine or whatever, you can take the whole breeding box, then uh, put it in a furnace, restructure it, and, um, well, I, I will come to this point later. In any case, by mere heat treatment, you can change the whole microstructure and with that the, also the material properties. Um, the operating temperature is limited to 550C. This is also <coughs> due to creep properties. For producing this 9% chromium steels, the typical classical physical metallurgy has been used. I will only give an, an overview. All these dots here are a variety of different 9% chromium steels and sometimes 12% chromium steels. Eurofair, as I have already shown, is here, a typical martensitic steel. And uh, there are some rules of how to produce these steels. For example, nickel equivalent is 3.7. Uh, the chromium, that's the um, other type of element, is around 11. There is also a rule to avoid delta ferrite formation. This is an important topic when it comes to joining, to, to welding. That's part of the following lecture. Um, this has all been considered for the development of Eurofair. Also, the phases we have already seen. You have to bring it up in the austenitic phase, then it looks like that. You can quench it down, then you have a typical modern side, last modern side structure. But you can also cool it down quite low within one or two days from uh, 1000 to room temperature and then it looks quite different. Then it forms perlite and ferrite and then it is a quite soft material. So all the things you can do with uh, Eurofair, but you cannot do this with austenitic steels. This is again another EBSD image where you can see this very fine martensitic glass which, con which contributes to the hardening, to the strengthening of this type of steel. And again, there are some rules from uh, empirical rules more or less for the metal met metallurgical development of such steels. This is to influence the martensite formation and end of Martin site formation temperatures. Uh, comparison of the rule ends up of a value with 433. In reality, the Martin site start formation temperature is 385. So far to the rules and their applicability. Don't trust rules, but nevertheless, it gives you some rule of thumb for this material. The other important temperature is 820 C if you, when you heat up Eurofair, that's the transition from alpha to gamma phase. Here is the answer to the question, what happens to the carbon in the Martin side? Here are again some solubility limits of carbon for different structures, this I have already mentioned. So if the austenite phase transfers into the ferritic martin sitic phase, the carbon, well, first is captured because, uh, well, in, in general it's not so soluble anymore, but it has been captured in the lattice and during tempering it has to diffuse somewhere. During this diffusion it combines often with elements which attract carbon, that's carbon formers and strong carbide formers are well, hafnium, zirconium, titanium. We don't have this in the Eurofair steel, but we have tantalum and we have vanadium. So, first thing, carbon forms vanadium carbides, tantalum carbides, and the remaining amount meets the 1% tungstenum in Eurofair and forms tungsten carbides. All this happens along grain boundaries, preferably that's or unless uh, boundaries and that's where the carbon ends. That's a summary of the treatment. We have already seen this. That's austenitization or solution <coughs> treatment. That's tempering. Solution treatment for Eurofair has to be performed above 900 C. Typically it's around 1000 C. 
the tempering, which performs the softening again of the martensitic phase, uh, happens in the range of uh, 650 to 800 C, but typically it's 750 or near this value in Eurofair and stress relieving typically takes place below 550 centigrades. Um, finally, well here again, this is a visualization of where the carbon ends. You see it here along the grain or lass structure that the white dots that happens during tempering. And finally the influence on the mechanical properties. You can easily see this in the hardness curves. Let's first start with heating the material up. It starts from 800 to 1150. See, it's a Sorry, it's a bit small, but if you perform this tempering then, uh, <coughs> and cool down, then you produce martensite with this captured carbon. It's called untempered martensite, which has a very high hardness, above 400 in Vickers hardness. That's quite hard. And uh, regardless of the temperature, 1100, or even 1150C, you always produce martensite with the same hardness. The only effect it has is on the grain size. This is plotted here. Grain size increases with uh, here along this line. Here, lower points mean larger grain size. And grain size means austenitic grain size. And this austenitic grain size becomes very, very large only at temperatures above 1100 C. So usually you avoid this high annealing area and do the austenitization around 1000 or 1100 C. Then if you <coughs> have produced this hard untempered martensite, you can temper it and this is shown here with increasing temperatures from 200 to 900 C. First nothing happens until around 600 C and then the softening starts and this is the temperature range where the carbon diffuses out of this tetragonally banded BCC lattice and this makes the martensite more and more soft and also more and more ductile and the optimum or the end is reached near 800 C. It's uh, around this value. If you exceed this temperature then you produce already more martensite and then the curve goes up and here it's continued <coughs> there. So here this is the effect of annealing, this is the effect of tempering. And finally here is an overview, a plot of yield strength, a plot of DPDT depending on the austenitization temperature and tempering temperature. And what you can see without going into details, you can tailor made your Eurofair material. Depending on any combination of uh, heat treatment, you can shape or produce very different material behavior, tensile strength or brittleness, DPDT shift, whatever. And this you cannot do again with austenitic steels. That's a very specific uh, feature for uh, martensitic steels. You can vary the material properties in a broad range merely by heat treatment. And well, what I call the implemented reset button of Eurofair or martensitic steels. Or, well, in some computer it means control alt delete. You know what happens. It's a restart, a reset. We have tested this for Eurofair. Here we have marked a typical prior or which you can recognize austenitic grain with the internal martensitic structure. We have marked this with four hardness imprints and then we have performed the same heat treatment again. Annealing, quenching, tempering. And after that, well, here are the four hardness imprintments and the structure has completely reshaped, restored. And this you can do at any time. We have done this, uh, I don't know, 20, 40, 50 times. Well, 
whatever you do with the material, you can destroy it, for example, by welding, by melding, by bending, by cold working, by, well, whatever measure. If you perform, again, this treatment, this means you push the reset button and the material is fully restored in terms of microstructure and properties. And, well, this is the main difference as well as the main benefit of modern civic steels like Eurofair. Thank you. Volume fraction of martensite fuzz can uh, uh, affect the damage. Which the damage? Uh, against irradiation. Uh, if I understood you this correct, could the... This morning it's all that you doped 9% chromium and it, in order to simulate the, the real behavior. Okay, if it contains martensite fuzz. Sorry, if? It contains martensite fuzz, 9% chromium steel, is, yeah. Okay. I want to know if changing the volume fraction of Martin State fuzz can affect the, the damage uh, against the irradiation. Maybe there is a misunderstanding. This Eurofero steel, as we use it, has a 100% volume fraction of Martin site structure. It's fully Martin City structured. And um, your question maybe is uh, how does the addition of boron affect the microstructure? Uh, well, it, it forms, uh, since boron is a carbon former, it forms carbides, carbi uh, uh, boron carbide precipitates. And this I mentioned, it's not fine or not so fine dispersed within the material. That's why we cause helium damage on very local spots, probably. And uh, this is why this boron doping and transmutation into helium is probably an overestimation of uh, uh, the damage. But in, in general, the, the Martin City structure has a beneficial effect in various ways because since it is very fine structured, it prevents the formation of big helium bubbles compared to, for example, for the austenitic steel. And also the, the very fine structured grain boundaries are very prominent and effective recombination centers for all kinds of um, irradiation damage. And so uh, in, in general, the material behavior, but in the, the very specific case of <coughs> swelling, you have seen, these materials are almost not showing swelling, or only in a very limited way, at least as far as we have now our database. But the austenitic steels uh, show very quickly and after a very short time of irradiation, strong volumetric swelling. And this is one of the biggest advantages of this 9% chromium steels when it comes to irradiation effects. The properties I was uh, talking about here have a significant effect on the fabrication technology. And this you will see in the next lecture where we will focus on welding. Hello. Uh, can you expect phase transformation in iron chromium alloys below 200 degrees Celsius? Uh, again, the phase transformation yeah. below 200? Be below 200. Mm. Like, yeah, phase, phase decomposition or... Uh, because all the diagrams you were showing were above 500. Could, uh, well, maybe we can back to the slide you are referring. Which one was it? Uh, I don't think you show any iron chromium, detailed iron chromium phase diagram, did you? Uh, ah, you are talking about phase decomposition below 200C. Yes. With or without irradiation? With, without irradiation, with there, is, there, there is a... Um, okay, this is also a very specific point which I have skipped here. 
the general, oh, well, uh, at the beginning maybe there, there was um, at least a hint of this thing. There is a phase called sigma phase in ion chromium and alpha prime. Um, uh, well, my mind it was at the very beginning. Ah, here. Yeah. With ion chromium, we have a behavior like that. And uh, at low temperature and, um, yeah, well, some chromium content, there is a phase called alpha prime which forms. And this means that chromium and iron is not completely soluble. So there are, uh, there is a phase composition. There are small fractions where we have chromium rich iron chromium parts and uh, this is called the, the, the alpha prime. You can hardly recognize them in, even in TEM. They are very small, tiny black dots in TEM. And uh, with increasing chromium content, there is the, the sigma phase. And the sigma phase is uh, comparable, or well, it's more or less the same we have seen in the uh, austenitic phases. This composition happens only for the higher chromium contents. I think it's uh, 12 and, and higher chromium um, parts in iron. For Eurofair, we don't have, uh, or I, I have never seen sigma phase formation, but uh, this alpha prime formation is always uh, part of the game, part of the picture. And, uh, well, I mentioned it briefly yesterday, during irradiation, during neutron irradiation, there can also be uh, phase decomposition due to this, uh, all these uh, irradiation defects and increased uh, diffusion in the materials. So the phase diagrams are modified a bit under neutron irradiation. So phase formation, phase decomposition takes place even at lower temperature because neutron irradiation enhances it a bit. Thank you. Thank you.